Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're having a great week. So I decided to come back with another message for you and I hope this message is going to bless you. Um, I have spent uh, the past um, few days at work as a, you know going walking to work and I've been look, uh, listening to the book of Acts and um, it's just opened up several things and the Lord has put a message in my heart to uh, to to give today and I hope this message is going to greatly bless you and I'm just going to get straight into it so I hope you are having a, a, a beautiful wonderful week I know things are a bit uh, dark and dim out there in the world but we are the light and the Lord uh, will use us greatly to do great things in his name so we just need to have faith and we just need to endure um, and um, know that the Lord is with us he will never leave us nor forsake us Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for all the people who are watching this um, video right now, Lord God, that you will anoint this message uh, that you are giving through me, Lord God, that you will bless us, Lord God, through this message uh, that is close to your heart, Lord God, for the transformation of our spirit, of our souls, and also for the uh, blessing and the movement of the church forward and blessing others to come into the kingdom, Lord God. Holy Spirit, right now I speak that every worry, burden and every anxiety that is in every person watching this or their family, Lord, be bound and casted out of them. I speak joy in the heart of the person watching. I speak joy and I pray for direction and new beginnings, Lord God. And I thank you for their lives. In Jesus' name, Lord God, I speak a great blessing upon the person who's watching this, Lord. And I thank you that your hand of love and protection is over them and their family, Lord Jesus. That you can hear our voices, you can hear our pleas and cries. We thank you, Lord God, for our daily bread and blessing us in Jesus' name, Father. Thank you. Amen. So I decided to um, come with a message that uh, the Lord has put in my heart to give today. And it's about the Antioch churches and the Christians um, who were obviously um, the first Christians, which were the apostles, the disciples who uh, uh, be, started being the movement of the church after Christ uh, died and resurrected, uh, that the Christians were now on their own uh, to by through the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I say on their own, I mean like uh, now they didn't have Jesus, they had the Holy Spirit with them and they had to now uh, go and uh, be uh, sort of the church for the world. And it's interesting that when we look at this in the Bible, it looks very easy when we're reading it. But in actual fact, it took a lot of faith uh, for Christians um, like these disciples uh, to build up the faith. Um, when Jesus died and resurrected, to actually build up the faith to understand uh, that the power of God is working in them and that they can do what Jesus did, even although they heard him say, "We, I give you authority in my name uh, to do miracles, to do wonders, to trample uh, on serpents. Uh, they had to believe this. Uh, they saw their Messiah going on the cross and now they've been left uh, on their own and it was like a test of faith for them to move forward, to be the light for the world in the midst of their pain of losing their Messiah, uh, you know, in the flesh. Uh, but at the same time, the ex excitement of knowing that what he said was real as they saw him resurrect and come back to them and give them a message to go out there and preach the good news. And what we see, what do we think when we think about the Antioch churches? How do we see the Antioch churches uh, the Antioch churches are the first churches that started after uh, the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. And these uh, disciples were obviously uh, the, the disciples, not just the 12 of them, but quite a lot of them who believed in Jesus, who were following Jesus. The Holy Spirit came upon them and these disciples had to go now out and, um, you know, build a church. And we see that um, the apostles um, were the first ones who had to build up the courage to do this. Uh, but when we think about the Antioch church ourselves, I mean, what is our thought about this? How do we perceive, perceive the Antioch church? Some of us think it's just the first church that started um, as God's, um, you know, um, movement for Christians uh, to spread the good news. 
But to me, um, Antioch means a lot more than just the first church. To me, it's not just about the first church. To me, it, Antioch means a lifestyle of a Christian and how we can compare uh, what their lifestyle was um, as the church that first began to what we are actually uh, experiencing ourselves and how we are um, moving in the movement of God in the Lord in uh, spreading the good news in doing what the first churches did uh, so for them in in those days uh, when the first church started through the apostles it was normal for them to see the move of God so naturally um, and God was so invited in their lifestyle that his presence manifested miracles amongst them, which didn't surprise most of them. Because when you read or hear the book of Acts or read it, you will see that when these things happened and miracles happened or, you know, um, sometimes God um, disciplined people. When these things happened, people were not surprised. And it's not the focus wasn't on uh, just what the miracle signs and wonders were. The focus was on the fact that they were working together and that God was invited because of the fact that their lifestyle was in God himself, in the Lord himself. They lived and breathed Jesus. And this is what made uh, the first church the Antioch church, a lifestyle of a Christian, not so much the fact that it was a church that started, but it was more like a, a lifestyle of a Christian and how they moved in God, which brought many signs and wonders as they lived their lifestyle for Jesus. And that was just um, a, a thing that followed them. It wasn't that they were looking for signs and wonders. They basically lived in God and God brought signs and wonders as he was invited in their daily lives, in their daily way of living. And uh, and when I say, you know, what do I mean when I say uh, by the way they lived in God? What do I mean? What is that question that I'm asking? How, you know, how did they live in God that brought so much miracles in their midst that they didn't even focus on the miracles they were just you know for them it was second nature it was more like just keep living the lifestyle of Jesus uh, they were more into uh, pleasing the Lord than the fact that they were seeing signs and wonders so when I hear the book of Acts uh, I'm thinking there's nothing that says oh Peter was jumping up and down when this happened or when you know God did this or uh, Paul started doing cartwheels and, you know, we don't read things like that about how they were uh, sort of like talking about signs and wonders and how, you know, they were talking more about how they were trying to help other people and how they lived a lifestyle for God uh, and everything else was what God did because he was invited in their midst. So what do I mean when I say they lived in God? Uh, before I answer that question, I have to uh, assess their lifestyle um, and how they basically uh, lived in God. And when we look at the book of Acts, which is um, the age of the church, the, you know, obviously the first church that started uh, called the Antioch Church, which is the first church, which is the age of the church, we notice certain things that they did that were similar to us, what we do now. So when we look at the church and how they lived, we have to first look at, you know, I suppose we can compare certain things and say, do we do these kind of things? Um, do we have similarities? And the example of similarities of what they had with us um, in certain things are evident and in other things are not as so as much evident so the certain certain things that i find that are evident in the you know in the church of antioch and our churches today is that like us they had a lot of flaws in the church they had a lot of issues with different people with different groups uh, obviously people not cooperating 
and there was a lot of flaws, flaws. So that's why we see some similarities between the Antioch church and us. So when we look at their lifestyle, we, which we will get into a bit further on in the, in the uh, chat, uh, what we first want to find out is what, what did they do that's similar, what we are experiencing in ourselves. And similar things are things like um, problems. They had problems uh, like us. Uh, sometimes they had issues with each other like us. They had fights amongst themselves like us. You know, uh, they had quarrels amongst themselves like us. So they had similarity like us. They were like, you know, human beings who were moving in God, but at the same time, uh, there were things happening amongst them, as we're experiencing, that were hindering uh, the church. And these things are something we obviously experience in our churches today. And one of these is in the book of Acts. It says uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, when the numbers of disciples started growing, uh, then, you know, one group of the Hellenistic Jews complained against the um, Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in daily distribution of food. So they were quarreling over food. They were quarreling over uh, things that they, you know, that obviously they were jealous that the other group were getting a bit more attention and were getting more uh, than they were getting. And they that, that's something they quarreled about. And the other one is a, a book of Acts 15, chapter 15, verse 35 to 41. It says, Paul and Barnabas parted paths uh, about an argument over another disciple called Mark, who kept deserting them. Barnabas had, you know, wanted um, Mark to go with them. But Paul was more, you know, very strict um, saying that because he's not really been following us and he's not consistent, I don't want him to go. And that, this caused the fight between Barnabas and Paul and they separated. So we see that things like this happen in our churches now. So there were similarities. They still had their emotions, which sometimes, uh, you know, made them do things that hurt each other. And, um, Truth being said, I'm a bit more like Paul in that I'm quite a hard leader myself. I'm quite, you know, if I if I find that people are not consistent in serving and if I find that people are not, you know, uh, keeping their word, it does hurt me because I think to myself that we, in order for us to true humility and, you know, let our yes be a yes and no be a no, we really need to keep our word. Uh, we really need to be of people who say what we mean and mean what we say. So I can understand Paul's argument here that um, he didn't want Mark to go with him. But then we have the other, you know, Christians like Barnabas, who are like more compassionate and saying, well, I think he should come. But they, they just didn't see eye to eye on that. And this brought separation between Paul and Barnabas. And again, we look at Gal Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, we see Paul confronts Peter in Antioch. Um, face to face, he confronts Peter. Uh, when Peter first arrived, he also ate with the, he also ate with, sorry, when Peter first arrived, he ate with the Gentiles, Gentile believers who were not circumcised. And what happened is that James came uh, with his friends and they came at the same time Peter was there and Peter moved away from the Gentiles who he was like eating with. And Paul basically took him to the side and corrected him, saying that, you know, this isn't the way we should do things, you know, because they were believers as well, the Gentiles. But Peter was scared that they would uh, they would uh, criticize his leadership. They would criticize him. And so there was elements of. Uh, elements of fear and flaws in the body of Christ that we see that are similar to what we go through in our churches today and certain things where we have weaknesses in that were similar to the disciples and the apostles as they were growing in the ministry of Christ on their own now without Jesus and they had arguments amongst themselves they had you know they were trying to do the best they could but they had differences of opinion 
Again, in the book of Acts, we see in chapter 10, verse 14, we see Peter was afraid to eat what he was shown in his vision um, because he didn't want to defile himself. And he kept saying, no, Lord, Peter answered, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So he was now even feeling, you know, argumentative with the Lord uh, because he's seeing this vision and he doesn't know if what he's seeing is right because he's thinking, you know, I've always been a Jew. I've always eaten uh, this type of food and I've not touched that and I can't eat that. Uh, but God's trying to show him now that um, he's blessed everything. Everything is clean through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it took him a while to understand this. So Peter had a lot of issues with eating with Gentiles and eating food that he thought wasn't right because obviously he had to renew his mind in that area uh, where he had been um, obviously uh, weakened. Whereas Paul was the Pharisee who became a believer and he's the one who was very quick to transform in his way of thinking. And we see similarities in that when we come to the kingdom of God, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and we come into the church, uh, some of us can have weaknesses in some areas and others can have weaknesses in other areas. And basically uh, they had similarities to us in that they had the same arguments, they had the same kind of uh, you know, uh, fear and worries um, and they were not sure whether sometimes they did the right thing or they didn't even though the Holy Spirit was guiding them. But um, in, in the midst of all this, in the midst of all the uh, confusion and banters and, you know, uh, you know, arguments and uh, disagreements, we also see that God moved supernaturally in the Antioch church. And I will go through some of the verses. There's absolutely loads of them. But some of the supernatural acts that happened were, for example, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 1 to 10, it talks about a lame man who was healed. And obviously everyone saw him and they couldn't believe their eyes. Um, and then we see in the book of Acts, chapter 4, 31, is a building was shaken because God wanted his uh, disciples freed. And you can read these for yourselves. In the Bible, there's so many, so many passages that I obviously can't go through every every one of them, the miracles that happened. But the few that the Lord enabled me to pick out for this message, uh, feel free to have a look at them. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, it says, Sudden death came to Ananias and Sapphira because they lied to the Holy Spirit. So, the, you know, there was like... The fear of the Lord was amongst them. There were supernatural things happening um, amongst them. God was moving greatly amongst them. And we see they also had flaws. We, we see that they also had weaknesses. But God was still doing great miracles. And in the book of Acts 5, chapter 5, 17 to 21, we see that imprisoned apostles were freed by an angel. And it did not at all surprise them. We don't see anything in the Bible about, you know, the disciples or the apostles being overly talking about them, you know, the supernatural. We see the supernatural happen, but most the majority of the writing was to do with how kind they were how they sacrificed, how they lived a godly life. But in the midst of doing that and in the midst of having their own personalities, God was still doing amazing signs and wonders in them and through them and amongst the people. And then we see in the book of Acts 8, chapter 8, verse 39, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. I mean, whoa. Uh, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. One minute Philip is baptizing, the next minute he was carried away. Just think how many times Philip must have had that experience. I mean, we're reading about it once, but this to them was a daily lifestyle uh, that they were, the move of God was so vast. They were not talking about how God carried him and what he did. 
It was more about the fact that they had to work quickly to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. And by doing what Jesus said, they were focused on living a lifestyle that was pleasing to the Lord and living a lifestyle that was obedient to the Lord. That was their priority when we see not so much the fact that there was, you know, there were there's a lot of writings about the fact that they were, you know, um, doing cartwheels over, uh, you know, God uh, carrying Philip or, you know, talking about it for hours on end about supernatural stuff. We don't see that in the Bible. We see more about the fact that their personalities and their lifestyle was transformed through the fact that they were obedient to God. And in the midst of doing that, God was doing supernatural things in their midst, which they were not using that as some kind of a trophy to say that I'm a good Christian, but it was more like less of me and more of God so that God's work can be done. And in the book of Acts 19, of chapter 19, verse 11 to 12, it, did, it says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Anything he touched was taken, like handkerchiefs, I don't know, maybe his shawl, whatever, was taken uh, everything he touched was taken to the sick and the sick were healed through this. And, you know, it just says to me that these disciples had dedicated their lives so much to, to the work of the Lord by living the lifestyle, not so much about following the supernatural, but living the lifestyle that God's presence in them and through them was so vast that people, because they were obedient and they were doing what was right, people were being healed automatically, not even by them touching them, but by them just touching their handkerchief or their, you know, their clothes. So they were, yes, they were human beings in that they had emotions where they fought with each other, they had flaws, they had personality issues, um, you know, they had fear of doing certain things like eating with other people or should I preach to the Gentiles, should I not? But at the same time, they stayed obedient by living the lifestyle that Jesus asked them, which is what he's asking us to do. Now, how did the old church live? It wasn't a Sunday service performance only. It wasn't that they just got together and they lived a Sunday service. What they did is they lived Sunday every day and throughout their lives. They were acting like a family. They were acting like a family, not a congregation or a community that's in a city. They were more like a family daily they were caring for each other. They were loving on each other. And they. we read how, how did they live in that they basically draw the presence of God is that they lived in a, in a, in a way where they were not, not just doing something one day and lukewarm the next day. What they were doing is consistently doing what God was asking them to do, living the lifestyle of a Christian where they were loving the family. And what I find, which I'm going to talk about, is that what made this church successful is that they had genuine love for the people. They had genuine love for God. It wasn't the fact that they were just doing it out of duty. Uh, you know, Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? And he said, yeah, he said, feed my sheep. And he had to ask him three times. He, you know, God wants us to genuinely love people, uh, to genuinely love serving, to genuinely love dedicating our time. It's not just about making our presence in a church on a Sunday, but it's about do we know really how to love? And do can we let God um, help us to learn how to love by listening to him and living the lifestyle so in the book of Acts, we see genuine love. In the, in the book of Acts 2.42, it says they devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, breaking of bread and to prayer. So it was a consistent, not just a one day on a Sunday, but it was the consistent gathering of um, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. And they devoted themselves to the teaching. That means they obeyed, they listened, and they actually moved. They did what was what they said. It wasn't just hearing and then, oh, it sounds great. We've got a great sermon out of this. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. And then we forget about it. It was they were devoted to the uh, teachings of the apostle, m trying to imitate them, to move like them in the act of love and uh, sacrifice and prayer. And in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 4, uh, 34 to 35, it says, Neither was there any among them that lacked. There was none among them that lacked. They didn't just pray for people to get help. They were the hand of God for the people. They were the ones who really, uh, you know, they were seeking God uh, for answers uh, for them to provide for the other people. They needed to depend on God daily because sometimes it wasn't the fact that, you know, they were working in a job and they were getting paid and they were paying. They were basically dependent a lot um, on the fact that they had to help each other, uh, selling their houses, selling their items. And the, the, the act of love brought the presence of God in their midst. God is love, the Bible says. And when we act in love and we be a blessing and also follow in the footsteps of Christ, then we see there is a lot more uh, that God wants to show us, that he wants to do through us. And in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, it says, Day by day they spent much of the time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. That means they were eating together. They fellowshiped together quite a lot and they ate bread and they were generous to their neighbors who didn't have bread. They gave them bread. They didn't just pray for them. They gave them. And in Mark 16, 20, it says they preached together. Uh, it wasn't about my ministry your ministry, who's got the most people in the ministry, but it was more about let's work together to spread the good news of the gospel and bring draw people into the kingdom, living the lifestyle that Jesus has asked us where we can love one another and be open to help each other. And what happened is that God is drawn because God is love and where the love is increasing in our hearts where love is increasing God is attracted to that and what happens is he can work through us even more and this is what happened in these uh, in these churches of the first they dedicated their lives in doing what Jesus said it wasn't just a Sunday service it was a daily lifestyle now what we see is we see that intimacy and love is what moved God in the Antioch church. Intimacy and love for the Lord because they they obeyed the Lord by trying to live the lifestyle that God wanted them to. Uh, but also the fact that intimacy towards their fellow, uh, you know, dis, uh, fellow um, believers who just come to know Jesus, they were having to help them even though they were infants in Christ. Maybe they had disputes amongst each other. They were having to also care for them and love for them not by just words or praying for them but by actually uh, providing for them and being able to love on them in the book of acts 4 chapter 4 verse 32 to 35 it says the believers shared their possessions now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul and none claimed private ownership of any possessions, everything was shared, there was no needy among them. God loves a giver. So we see in the book of Acts 4, it says they were of one heart and one soul. This is so important for us. If we want the Holy Spirit to really operate 
in our lives, in the, the miracles that we saw, and we are sometimes jealous of these and saying, how is it, Lord, that, you know, it's happened to the Antioch church, but we're not seeing half of these. It's because they were in one heart and one soul. Why? Because they were all doing the same thing. Not, it wasn't just, you know, one doing it. They all did the same thing. And because of that, they were of one heart and one soul. Yes, they did have disputes. However, they still loved each other. In our families, we can have disputes, but we still love our families and we help them. We still do the right thing and love on them. So how did the old church live? It wasn't a Sunday service only. They lived Sunday every day. And um, what we see now, what we see now is we want to, as churches now today, we want to imitate the churches of the old. We read the book of Acts and we see God did many miracles but we're doing things the wrong way. God, what God is trying to do right now in this season is he's trying to make the body of Christ into an Antioch church. We're going in, we're going into a season where God is shaping the body of Christ and individual people in the body. We've got to be ready for this. And what he's doing right now is he's creating a church that is an Antioch church. What he's saying to us right now is what we're doing is good and we have good intentions. However, we are imitating the wrong thing. So when we're looking at the Antioch church, we are looking at the miracles. We're looking at the handkerchief that Paul, Paul passed to somebody who needed healing when he couldn't be there. And what we do in our ministry is we get handkerchiefs, we pray on it, and we say, we create a business on it, and we say, right, send us an offering, and we will send you this handkerchief, and you will be healed. And this is wrong, because this is not how God wants to move in the church, whereas all we're doing is just copying the miracles rather than copying the lifestyle. The Lord wants to create the Antioch church in us in copying the lifestyle, of what they did, which might not be easy to us by obeying what God is saying, but he prefers us to copy and imitate the lifestyle of the Christians who were working together in one heart, in one soul, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ, than the fact that we are just going from church to church, looking for superheroes who are anointed, because we want to receive some of that anointing and we want to pass it on. God can, God's anointing cannot be bought. God will not share his glory with anyone because that will make it witchcraft. A bit like this, uh, the, uh, the a sorcerer who, when he heard in the book of Acts that Philip was praying for people, he wanted God's power and he said, I'll pray for it, I'll pay for it. And, you know, Peter started rebuking him, saying, you know, may you and your, you know, money and whatever you have, uh, you know, God basically bring judgment on that. And what happened is we might think to ourselves, we're not directly saying to somebody as we go to these different, different uh, places where we say, oh, there's a revival there. There's a revival there. And we just want the anointing but we're not living the lifestyle because that is a bit like that Simon who wanted to pay for the anointing. I'm sorry, I sound really harsh here, but it upsets me because I was like that when I first went. We all get excited about the supernatural, uh, you know, acts of God in the body of Christ. But what we also have to understand is that God does not operate through us just to bring you know, uh, an act of miracle that was the same as 2000 years ago. He wants to do something new. He wants to do new miracles in all of us. He doesn't want you to copy a miracle of somebody else who had, uh, you know, a miracle 2000 years ago, uh, you know, with a handkerchief. He doesn't want you to copy the supernatural miracle and 
call, say, oh, the anointing is on me to do this. This is not how God operates. What he wants to do is he wants you to walk the walk of Christ and talk in Christ and live the lifestyle of Christ daily and be compassionate and open your heart to love. And me too. He's talking to me too. I'm saying it, but he's talking to me too. And as a result of walking in this, what he does is then this, you know, your lifestyle will be a supernatural lifestyle where it will become second nature to you. And you won't think, oh, you know, the spirit of God has just taken me from this man to this man. It was normal for Philip to be taken by the spirit from one place to another. He wasn't moved by the supernatural he was moved by walking and doing what pleases jesus and the supernatural was just god saving people through him but he had to basically spread the good news and this is where we have to be careful we have to live the lifestyle and not follow what how do i say celebrities christian celebrities and i'm not saying that you know um what they're doing um is not of God but what I'm saying is that if all we're doing is following the supernatural and the anointing and we're only wanting to do similar things that the Bible people received in, in terms of the supernatural from God then what we're doing is we're imitating the supernatural not actually imitating the lifestyle of Jesus walking the lifestyle in bringing what God is telling us to do uh, we cannot uh, use the handkerchief uh, that Paul used to heal the sick because God wants to maybe do something different in you and he's saying to us we need to learn to walk in Jesus and be as one in one accord with each other love one another and love the Lord enough to know we need to obey him and the signs and wonders will follow us and they will not be something will be like oh it's signs and wonders it will be more like, who can, who can I go to next, Lord, that you can perform the miracle on them yourself? And, it, you know, God will not always perform the same signs and miracles uh, all the time in the same way. He is a very creative God and we just want to put him in a box. Oh, we just want the anointing and we want to do it like the way Paul did or Peter did. But he's saying to you right now, he's saying you need to go out of the box and you need to live the lifestyle so that he can basically come in. You know, it's not about how he's going to anoint you for you to have the power to do it. It's about you inviting him by living the lifestyle, by living in one accord with his Holy Spirit and with the people to love, to give, uh, to be a Christian on a daily basis so that he can do this. And, um, you know, so we cannot, the power doesn't lie in going from conference to conference. By all means, yes, we do need to uh, increase our faith by, uh, you know, learning and having teachers and having evangelists, by having prophets. Uh, but we also need to understand that we need to spend quality time, not only with the Holy Spirit, uh, but with, you know, in, in prayer, in, um, in reading the word of God to obey what God is saying and also being in one accord with each other as a family even though we have disagreements that we need to break bread we need to pray together we need to enjoy each other's company uh, even if it hurts so anyone any of us who chases after signs and wonders will burn out now listen to me if you chase after signs and wonder you will burn out do you know why you will burn out you will burn out because you will keep chasing you will keep going from one conference to another, from one revival to the next, but yet you will not possess that same thing. That's because the person who's, you know, who's having a revival is because they're actually doing what Jesus is saying. They're going out there and they're loving on people. Uh, they are being the hand of God for them. They are being the voice of God for them. And what we do is we go and say, oh, this is an anointed man of God and we want to have the same thing. But we come back and we still feel empty and we burn out and we become depressed and anxious. Nothing is happening. And it's nothing to do with the signs and wonders. It's to do with our walk. It's to do with our lifestyle. You know, we can't be lukewarm Christians, all of us. We need to be firm and decisive in our walk with Jesus in that we need to 
even if it hurts or we think we don't like sharing or we don't like preaching or we don't we need to go out of it out of get out of our comfort zone to be able to help other people now this is the exciting part and i'm coming to the end of this is how do we become an antioch church okay how do we become an antioch church and i'm going to tell you how we become an antioch church if you want to see god moving uh, amazing in your life as i do in mine and i'm practicing this is that we need to be an antioch church we need to be like that first church that was so hungry to bless other people to bless uh, you know in every means that we have and also to be in love with god so much that we will do what he says that these are the things we need to do the first thing we need to do is to be an antioch church is that <clears throat> First thing, and this is really important, is to openly confess our faith to others like the apostles did. That was the first thing they did, <clears throat> is that they openly went out. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the first thing the apostles did, is they openly confessed to people that they followed Jesus. What does this mean? Is don't just shine your light in the church. Don't just shine your light amongst Christians uh, and, you know, have a good behavior on a Sunday service and hide this Jesus in, you know, inside of you when you go to work or because you're afraid that people won't like you or that, you know, uh, you're afraid of things. Why? Because God is drawn. The spirit of God is drawn when jesus is exalted okay so the spirit of god and this i know because i i do this so i can you know i'm happy to say i'm not ashamed to talk about jesus and believe me i can tell you that i have had a lot of dislikes at work i've had people who've dismissed me from work and have told me to not speak about jesus so this bit i know how to do and this is the bit where opening opening up your faith is the, one of the biggest things because what you're doing is you're actually preaching Jesus by saying to people, I'm a Christian. You know, I do this, I do that. The second thing that you need to, be, to do to become an Antioch church is that by sharing, you will be disliked and persecuted. It's a part of being a Christian. And I've gone through that as well. So I'm happy to say in this part of the Antioch church, I've experienced this as well, is through this, God will show grace and take you to the next level of your faith. Why? Because through the persecution and the pain and the hurt, what God is will do is he will increase your faith. You might think to yourself, I, I'm not ready to be persecuted. I'm not ready to be kicked out of work. I'm not ready to tell that person on the street that I want to pray for them because, you know, I'm a Christian. Uh, what happens is that uh, God wants to take you to the next level, like he did with the Antioch disciples who openly had to be persecuted and take lashes and to get, you know, insults and to get all sorts of abuse thrown at them. And this is the second thing that will happen when you become an Antioch church, that you will get persecutions and God's grace will enable you to take you to the next level where he will show you how to forgive people. This is very important because a lot of us, uh, we believe that we need to forgive. We believe that we need to, uh, you know, uh, pray for others. But, gen but if we're not sharing Jesus and we've not experienced pain and persecution and endurance, what happens is that really we are not forgiving people because we are holding back because we are in pain. But by confessing Jesus, because you get persecuted and disliked and because you will be, uh, you know, judged by others. What happens is that God will give you by his grace uh, the ability to forgive. He will actually soften your heart to see why people need, uh, you know, his grace, why they're hard at heart. So it will enable you to have a stronger prayer life. And this is the second thing about being an Antioch church. The third thing is that you will have to stretch out your hand to give as an Antioch church. Heal and help. Heal and help and to give. Many people in the body of Christ, uh, you know, don't have the time or don't give them the si time, give themselves the time to serve uh, or to be a blessing to their neighbor or to actually you know stretch out their hand when somebody is in need oh it's not my problem you know i'll pray for them 
I'll pray for them. But God says, what good is it when you pray for somebody who's like hungry? It says it in the Bible. Go and find the verse. Why should I tell you? You should go and search for it yourself. Go and look. And it says, you need to stretch out your hands and give and give and to heal and to help. And this is called service. And you will start growing as you start speaking your faith, as you start being persecuted and understanding how to forgive. And God takes you to the next level of your faith. And then you'll start serving God with all your heart. It's not now, oh, I'm serving tomorrow, but I just can't be bothered. I'm just doing it so people know I'm in a team. People know that I'm actually, you know, I just want to socialize and make friends. Friends, if your heart is wrong, you know, in, in doing this, it's best not to serve until God is working in you and helping you understand the importance of what Christ means to you and, how, you know, what how it means what it means for him to save other people's lives and start by sharing your faith first maybe that will help you and then serve the lord and then the fourth thing we'll see is that uh, when we are when we are of service we're putting others needs before our own and we're dying to our own uh, you know self's desires we're now not seeking things of the world where once it seemed so attractive where we we're lukewarm where we're thinking oh you know, I'd rather go to the cinema than be of service to somebody else. I'd rather go and drink a beer with my Christian friends than, you know, than do something here. It's too, you know, it's too much for my flesh. I went to church and, you know, I smiled at people. I'm being really hard here, but, you know, I'm, I'm making a point. But the book of Matthew 6.33, it says, First seek the kingdom of heaven and everything will be added to you. First seek in putting others before your needs. And God will take care of you. Now, the time when I experienced this the most was when I was serving in my previous church. And I was doing a lot of weekends, going out there, reaching out to people. And I was exhausted. And there were times where I was like, you know, oh, I don't have time to do my own shopping, like clothes shopping. And I don't have. And people would bring it to me, whatever I desired. I once desired a treacle cake, you know, something really sweet. There was nothing in my uh, house you know at the time my neighbor went had gone to the market he wasn't a christian but god spoke to his heart to bring something back for me and you know god blessed me with things that i needed and i saw that side of serving others putting others first before my own needs where matthew six thirty three came apparent and that was a supernatural thing and then it became a normal thing for me it wasn't like something i boasted about god you know sorted out my mortgage, God sorted out my flat, God sorted out everything that was like, you know, I was going through, but I wasn't putting attention on the things that I needed, even though, you know, I knew they were in the process of being done. I was putting attention in serving others, going out there, uh, helping other people. God naturally brought them to me and he gave them to me. So I can say I'm a witness of this and this is what he wants to do. So serving other people. And the fifth thing is remaining in fellowship with God uh, by yourself and with other people. Remaining in fellowship uh, by spending time with God, uh, you know, by spending time with others, in, in uh, fellow believers, by, you know, obviously being with them, uh, praying with them, loving on them, and also um, sharing with them. Number six be of good cheer and keep persevering in trials and tribulations when God allows Satan to test you. Again, in Antioch Church, we see that Paul especially went through a lot of trials. Even P uh, Apostle Peter, he was imprisoned. Uh, you know, he was even tested uh, to be killed. Uh, but he basically uh, had the patience, endurance and uh, perseverance in trials why because he was grown in the lord then and the same with peter uh, with apostle paul he had you know he was thrown off a cliff and god was with him he just got up and started preaching again can you imagine you know when you live a lifestyle for god it's not about oh god brought me back to life everyone you know it, he just got up and started preaching again it wasn't the supernatural that moved him uh, to make him feel excited it was the fact that he still had a job to do in in the lord which he had to continue in preaching the good news so he was more focused on 
you know, being humble and doing what the Lord said them, the fact that there was, you know, signs and wonders going on. And he, he was that himself a sign and wonder that God brought him back to life when they threw him off a cliff. And also the fact that Satan was testing him. And Paul, at some point, he did get weary and tired. And he said, I don't think I can, you know, I don't think I can endure this. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. God gave him strength by saying, you know, I know your flesh is tired. I know. But he says, my grace is sufficient in your weakness, because in your weakness, then the power of God is actually operating stronger in you. Now it's not you. It's him who is in you that is doing the miracles. It's not by your you know, power. It's by the Holy Spirit. God will keep your vessel going. And he just says to you, he allows the testing to happen. As you keep increasing in the Lord and you keep increasing in your ministry for the Lord, what happens is that God will bring even harder um, harder trials your way so that he can say to Satan, look at that faithful servant. He's as pure as gold. He's been refined as gold. He's gone through trials and tribulations and yet he has come out as gold. You're not blessed just because you have a car or you have a house and there's nothing worrying in your life. If actually, if anything like that, I'd be more worried. You, I'd say if you are moving in God and the blessing sometimes comes when trials and obstacles come one after the other. And you think to yourself, as it says in the book of James, something weird is happening to you. And, you know, in the book of James, it says, don't think it unusual that these things are happening to you. It's God basically who's trying to increase you uh, and increase your faith. And what is happening is these trials and testings, God will allow it only for the, you know, when you're very strong, he'll start allowing it. So don't mock somebody who's going through a bad time because you don't know if they're actually going through that time because God is actually taking them to the next level and trying to help them uh, increase, to getting rid of the weaknesses they have through the trials and obstacles because uh, weaknesses, the way God gets rid of our weaknesses is by putting us through trials, is by putting us through the fairness to test our faith. What happens is that when we are broken, then the, we are now no longer depending on our, on our own vessel. We're saying, God, help me. And number seven is uh, be open to hear the voice of God when he is talking to you and he will do the rest himself. Be receptive, be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit when he is talking to you. Don't ignore it. As you keep growing, like the Antioch churches, God spoke to the apostles and they listened. And God said to them, go here. And they listened and he said to them, go there. So be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and God will do the rest. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bless every person, Lord God, right now who's been listening to this message. Increase our faith, Lord, and give us endurance. Bless us as churches to be real. Bless us, Lord God, to not be afraid to walk like the first churches of Antioch, to be the church of Antioch as you're changing us, Lord God, in this new year. Help us, Lord God, to stretch out our hands and be givers and open our hearts, Lord God, to receive from you the things that you want to do in other people by denying ourselves and being the best we can for others. Help us, Lord God, to uh, increase in faith by reading your word and spending time with you. Jesus, I speak to every person right now who's watching this, that you will increase their faith, Lord God, as even that small mustard seed that's in them, Lord, let it grow. And Lord God, speak to their hearts and Lord, Help us, Lord God, to be obedient to you. Draw us towards your path of righteousness. Enable us by your grace, Lord God, to be able to do the things you've asked us to do. I rebuke and cast out fear. I rebuke and cast out sicknesses, infirmities. And I pray, Lord God, that every person right now who's listening, I pray that you will enable them by your grace to forgive their past, to forgive their selves, of anything that has been going wrong in their lives, to forgive those who've done them wrong, to who've hurt them, so that they can move on in victory in your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Until next time, stay blessed, and uh, please do move like the Antioch Church. Take care for now, bye.